Amazon. This is a short video lecture for HKBU's RELI 3087 Metaphysics. This is for the uh, week 12 lesson on free will. Now our syllabus, our, um, our, course, our course description in the syllabus requires us to cover free will and I decided to just go with this brief survey of the issue. I don't believe I even assigned you a reading. No, you can find ample readings on the subject by um, just considering what else we've studied this semester. And email me if you want if you want more suggested readings on free will. And of course, re readings suggested by the philosophers I'm about to mention. So first, roughly, as I go, I'm going to be filling in the notes that are linked from Moodle. Roughly, the will is our ability. It is our ability to do what we want with ourselves, or our ability to decide and act. Some of the classical definitions call attention to the link between free will and reason. Roughly, free will is the human ability to act by reason rather than by mere instinct and mere desire. So in Aquinas, for example, free will is, quote, the faculty and will of reason. I think you find similar things in Locke or Kant. Uh, the, the idea is that an animal has to act on its impulses, or a mere animal. If you define humans the Aristotelian way as rational animals, a mere animal, a dog, a horse, uh, a cat, an insect, may act on impulses. There may be some level of consciousness, but there's no ability to decide whether to act on impulse. They have impulses, they have animal instincts, they act on them. They don't have the ability to, to reason and act on reason. So, you know, if I have an impulse to, to drink from my gigantic cup of tea that I brought for this occasion, um, if my reason intervenes and tells me to resist my physical desires, I have some ability to act on reason and resist my physical desires. Fortunately, in this case, reason concurs that um, having some caffeine is a, is a good idea on this particular morning, so I'm, I'm not going to resist. Now, if I were to resist, that would be a case of me acting on reason rather than on sheer animal impulse. That is the difference between human beings and animals. That is largely what free will consists of. It is the ability to act on reason and not merely on instinct. This is, again, a classical definition, uh, a classical account of free will. So the will is our ability to do what we want, or our ability to decide and act. And some say that reason and free will work very closely together, or free will is the ability to act on reason. Is the will free? That's the crucial question we have to look at. Is the will free? Well, that depends. The first thing is to figure out exactly what we're talking about. Free will has more than one meaning. The free will might be the ability to make our own decisions without having any external forces preventing us from making those decisions or from acting on them. Or free will might be what is sometimes called libertarian free will. This is the ability to do otherwise, to choose to act differently than what we do. So we can call these weak free will and strong free will. The ability to make our decisions without having any external forces preventing us from acting on them and the ability to actually do otherwise, to do other than what we do. Now, you can have free will in this weak sense without having free will in the strong sense, not vice versa. If we have strong free will, we have weak free will. If we have the ability to do otherwise, to choose to act differently than we do, then presumably we also have the ability to make our own decisions without having any external forces preventing us from acting on them. It's what we do. It's our decision. But it's plausible that we have weak free will, but not strong free will, that we have the ability to make our own decisions, external forces are not preventing us from acting on them, but the internal forces, what we are, is a being, or what I am, let's, let's keep it singular and not get too confused by the grammar, what I am is a being who makes that decision, and I don't have any option of doing anything else. Um, I, I'm not free to, to, to not be a human being, am I? And if, um, if, I am free to make the decisions I make, but those decisions that I make are 100% determined by the kind of being I am, but I am being the kind of being I am, then you might say I have free will in this weak sense. But we've already seen this. This came up with Dennett, you recall. It's not like 
reviewing done it now. It's not like there's some uh, some little piece of the brain where the magic of consciousness happens, and and your brain makes you do it. But you 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 are the tiny little piece of the brain that um, experiences things and rationalizes your decision. But the rest of your brain is what makes the decisions. Your brain makes you do. Your brain makes. This one little tiny piece of your brain, most of your brain makes this one little tiny piece of your brain, that is you, do the things you do. You're not free. Your brain is making the decisions for you. That is one way of thinking through, well, life and metaphysics and free will and the brain and the mind and personal identity. And it's not a good way of thinking through things. That's Dennett's very fine point. The brain that makes the decision is you. You are not this tiny little piece of the brain where magic happens. You are the whole thing. The, the entire brain, the entire set of mental processes, that is what you are. And if that acts according to necessity and there's no chance of going, of, of making a different decision, there's no chance of you doing other than you did, but what decided to do that was the whole brain and you are the whole brain, of course you're free. That's Dennett's way of thinking. That is what we call compatibilism. It's the theory that we have free will, at least in this weak sense, and, uh, and are still determined. So libertarian free will, strong free will, means we have the ability to do otherwise, to choose to act differently than we do. The self, probably better conceived as the whole brain, then it's just a piece of the brain, or the self conceived in whatever way seems appropriate with hylomorphic dualism, you can still say the whole brain while saying uh, matter does not produce consciousness, or in the Cartesian view or the Barclayan view, maybe there is no brain at all in Barclay, except uh, that which our minds perceive. Uh, you're just the mind, and in Descartes, you're the mind, but you connect, your mind connects to the brains. Um, in whatever the conception we're using is of the human person, in libertarian free will, according to the theory of libertarian free will, you have the ability to do otherwise than as you do. So this is only a real thing if something we call the principle of alternate possibilities is correct. Principle of alternate possibilities, the PAP, is the theory that there is a genuine possibility of doing otherwise. Now, is the principle of alternate possibilities the case? Um, this is really the crucial question in asking uh, what sort of free will we might have. Now that I look at my notes, I see that there are references to an IEP reading. <laughs> I'm sorry, I may have actually given you a reading and then forgotten I'd given you a reading. Sorry, I'm absent-minded. So that's a good reading, and if you want more readings, consult that reading and uh, whatever citations it may make. Now, the terminology can be confusing because people don't always use exactly the same terms. What I'm calling strong free will is what is often called libertarian free will, and what other people just call free will. And um, I believe our reading in the IEP uses the term freedom of will to refer to what I'm suggesting we call strong free will, or what some people call libertarian free will. What I'm suggesting we call weak free will, I think, is what the reading is going to call freedom of action. So don't don't get confused. Freedom of will means strong free will and libertarian free will. Freedom of will, as the term is used in the reading from the IEP, means strong free will or libertarian free will. Freedom of action in the me in the reading is what I'm suggesting we call weak free will. As long as you keep track of what are the different definitions of the terms, it shouldn't be too confusing which terms are being used. This this happens, I'm afraid, in philosophy. This happens in life um, <laughs> or in realism. I've probably told you on more than one occasion. It can have dramatically different meanings in, for example, uh, political science and philosophy. And even in one branch of philosophy and another, it can have very different reading uh, meanings. And even in metaphysics, the word realism can have different meanings. So let's look at another definition. Determinism is the theory that our actions are determined, obviously. We might may need to make this a little more precise. What if our decisions are the results of quantum randomness? Does that mean that our decisions are not determined? They just might. So let's, let's disambiguate the term determinism. Uh, note, uh, parenthetically, I note on the notes, and I suggest you note this as well, note that there are some interpretations of quantum, quantum physics where there is um, not actually quantum randomness. This is a common understanding 
of quantum physics. It's a very influential understanding of quantum physics. But I understand there are some interpretations of what's happening uh, with the electrons that <laughs> says that it's not actual randomness. But uh, the, imp the, the question I'm trying to get at is this. Let's, let, me, let me put it this way. Would you say that at the beginning of the universe, what most of us think of as the Big Bang, if you want to think of theological terms from the moment God first spoke reality into existence or however, however we phrase that, well, the rest of reality, presumably if there's a God, God is also real. From the beginning of the universe, Big Bang or whatever, were the motions into which all the different particles were set such that my picking up this nice gigantic cup of tea here, mug, tumbler of tea, such that this was inevitable. Is this action 100% probability based on the trajectory of the particles one moment after the Big Bang? One moment after the universe began to exist, is it the case that the motions of the particles in the universe at that time made it 100% probable that at 7.55 a.m. HK time on uh, 15 November, I would pick up this cup of tea? Is that the case? If so, my actions are determined. But what if whether I picked up the cup of tea is uh, determined by some random fluctuation of electrons in my brain? Am I determined? Usually when we use the word determined, what we mean is there was always a 100% chance of it happening, and if you went back to the very beginning of the universe, if you had a sufficiently uh, detailed way of tracking the motions of all the particles and a computer to calculate it all, you can predict everything, everything, everything that would ever happen. You could predict every single future event from the very beginning if you, if you had enough uh, information and a good enough computer for predicting it. That's how we usually think of determinism. But some of us might want to say that if my actions are the result of random motions of electrons, random fluctuations of electrons in my brain, and not the result of my decision, then I am determined. Well, well, that's why sometimes we need to take great care to finding our terms and disambiguate our terms. Here's a disambiguation I can suggest. Weak determinism is the theory that our actions are entirely the result of forces which are outside of our control. Strong determinism is the theory that our actions are entirely the result of forces which are outside of our control and which are necessary. I note in the notes, parenthetically, and you should note as well, the IEP reading says causal determinism is the thesis that the course of the future is entirely determined by the conjunction of the past and the laws of nature. So their causal determinism is their terminology for what I'm suggesting we call strong determinism. That's fine. Just um, be prepared for when someone, I, I've thought like this myself in the past, or perhaps you think like this, when someone thinks, if my action is the result of random fluctuations of electrons and not of my own decision, then my action is determined. Be prepared when someone thinks that to either come up with an alternative definition of determinism or some new terminology that will help to make things clear. So I'm suggesting weak determinism and strong determinism. And if strong determinism is true, so is weak determinism, but not necessarily vice versa. So what do we have so far? We have some distinctions between how we might use the term determinism and some distinctions between how we can use the term free will. We've observed the will is our ability to do what we want or to decide and act. It's classically associated with reason in people like Aquinas, Locke, Kant. Is the will free is our big question. And we have to make a distinction between libertarian free will or strong free will and weak free will. Some people, like Dennett, say that we have weak free will but not strong, and we don't need strong free will. Also, our actions are determined. Determinism means our actions are the result of forces outside of our control, and in the usual sense of the term, they are entirely necessary. There's a 0% chance of them going otherwise. So... What's true? Do we have free will? Are we determined? These are the questions that we're supposed to be addressing today. Let's get to them. The two general theories we want to be aware of are what is called compatibilism and incompatibilism. I think I've already told you compatibilism is the theory that free will is compatible with determinism. And this only works for weak free will, not for strong free will. So if, if you insist on using the term strong free will, uh, sorry, if you insist on using 
the term free will to refer to libertarian free will or strong free will, then um, uh, compatibilism uh, won't work as a term. But again, change the terms, come up with new definitions, uh, alternative definitions, uh, free will definition A, free will definition B. That's essentially what I'm doing here. Compatibilism is the theory that free will, at least in this weak sense, is compatible with determinism. Incompatibilism is the theory that that's not the case, that we must have free will we must have free will in the strong sense if, uh, if we're going to say that we have free will at all. So the questions we have to consider here include, do we have strong free will or do we only have weak free will? Or perhaps neither. And is free will enough for human freedom or must we have strong free will to really be free? So this actually does matter how we use the terms. Um, sometimes the use of terminology in uh, these discussions in philosophy is complicated just because words are used in different ways and people confuse each other and talk past each other and you need to just define your terms and sometimes come up with alternate definitions and sometimes people need to come up with alternate names. That's a great tradition in philosophy. There was a theory called foundationalism in epistemology and there was a theory called coherentism and Susan Hack says, I like the neologistic school of philosophy. I side with that. My theory is found herentism, and it was a wonderful word uh, for what I take to be a pretty darn respectable theory in epistemology. What else? Um, pragmatism. Uh, C.S. Peirce, American philosopher, used the word pragmatism. William James liked it. He started using the word pragmatism. He developed the theory in directions Peirce didn't like. So Peirce thought, well, dang it, my theory is called pragmaticism now, and that's such an ugly name. No one will ever steal it. But sometimes how we use the terms matters for a little bit more than that because the term signifies something really important like what does it mean to be human? We think human beings must have freedom. What are we talking about? Well, presumably we're talking about free will and to get this issue right we might actually have to narrow down exactly which term is correct. Is weak free will enough for human freedom? Or does human freedom require strong free will? And probably this is um, now, probably the first and the third question I'm going over here are the most important. Is strong determinism true? Or is weak determinism true? Or neither? Do we have strong free will? Or just weak free will? Or neither? Is strong determinism true? Or just weak determinism? Or neither? And obviously, those questions overlap somewhat. If strong determinism is true, we sure don't have strong free will. All right, so some of the major theories that we have to look at are these. These are some of the important ways these questions have been answered. Theological determinism is a good name for the theory that our decisions are the result of God's sovereign will. Now, this is not a dominant theory in academia these days, but it is very important historically and culturally, and it's, it does have a presence in academia. For example, in uh, any number of uh, seminaries or some universities, with a uh, tradition in the reform branch of Christian theology, this will come up. Theological determinism may or may not be compatibilistic. A theory with some influence in theology, for example, the Calvinist tradition, some Islamic traditions, this is what we're talking about. This is a theory that has a lot of historical significance, even if it's not dominant in universities these days. Now, the one I know the most about is Calvinism. Calvinist theories of theological determinism often say, I think usually say, that our sinful decisions are the result of sin, which is not actually God's fault. Sin is from our own sinful nature, which comes from Adam's sinful nature, which comes from Adam's sin. And Adam actually did have strong free will, according to uh, one prominent strain of Calvinist theology. Now, there's a term here that's in your notes. I may just uh, pause the recording of videos so I can hammer out a quick definition of these terms. Infralapsarian versus superlapsarian Calvinism. Infralapsarian Calvinist says that Adam had strong free will. He had the ability to do otherwise. The superlapsarian Calvinists say otherwise. And they say Adam did not have free will to do otherwise, not strong free will. There was no ability for him to do otherwise. What was happened what happened when Adam sinned was uh, something that happened with a 100% probability. There was never any chance of it going any other way. So theological determinism uh, is a thing in some of our theological traditions. This comes up in Augustine too. Um, if we, uh, well, depending perhaps on how we interpret certain texts in Augustine, the 
the idea is probably very similar to that of infralapsarian Calvinism. Adam had strong free will. Uh, we don't seem to anymore. So theological determinism or a closely related variation, uh, you could perhaps posit uh, a, a different term here, and I may just make some adjustments in the notes accordingly. You might posit a different term for the theory, not that God's sovereign will causes our decisions, but that God's, uh, but that our sin causes our decisions, and you might call this not theological determinism uh, so much as, I don't know, uh, sin nature determinism, or better yet, make two different definitions of theological determinism. I've now adjusted our notes in this way. Theological determinism is a good name, I suggest, for several different closely related theories. One, our decisions are the result of God's sovereign will. This is a view attributed to Al-Ghazali, I believe, a medieval Islamic philosopher. Two, our decisions are the result of our nature as the kind of beings God created us as. This is a view I think we can safely attribute to Leibniz. Or, our decisions are the result of our sinful nature, a view we can attribute to Calvinism. And um, there's some connections to Augustine here as well. Now, I'm spending too much time on this, perhaps. Let's see if we can move on. Let's see if we can review and move on so that when we move on, we know what the heck we're talking about. We are talking about free will. We observe that will is our ability to do what we want with ourselves or to decide and act. We've noted a connection between will and reason, or at any rate, free will and reason in some classical sources, Aquinas, Locke, Kant. We've asked, is the will free? We've made a distinction between two different concepts, strong free will and weak free will. We've observed the importance of the principle of alternate possibilities, the theory that there is a genuine possibility of us doing other than we do, a necessary uh, condition for us having strong free will. We've observed that there are two plausible senses of the word determinism. We've attempted to make a useful distinction between weak and strong determinism. <clears throat> We've observed that our major questions are, do we have strong free will or just weak free will, or perhaps neither? And what kind of free will is enough for genuinely human freedom? And is strong determinism true or just weak determinism or neither? And now we're looking at some major theories. One of them is theological determinism. Another is materialistic determinism. Now this is a uh, much more prominent theory in academia these days. This is the theory that our decisions are the result of the laws of physics. Now materialistic determinism could be compatibilistic or incompatibilistic. And it could be a strong or a weak determinism. A materialistic weak determinism would posit that our decisions are partly the result of quantum randomness. A strong materialistic determinism would posit that all of our decisions are the result of necessity. Now, Dennett is a compatibilistic materialistic determinist. He thinks we have free will in what I'm calling the weak sense, and we are determined. So, uh, what else? Another theory is called compatibilism, and Dennett, as I said, is a compatibilist. Other famous compatibilists include, I believe, David Hume and um, our old friend, who we looked at this semester, Thomas Hobbes. So, obviously, there's some overlap here. We have theological determinism, materialistic determinism, and we have compatibilism. And, in fact, uh, your average Calvinist, theological determinist, is also a compatibilist, saying we have freedom to do what we want to do, but what we want to do is fixed by our sin nature because we're, or, you know, we're that corrupt big jerks that we humans are. And um, a materialistic determinist may or may not be a compatibilist. So we're going over some major theories here. But these are not always inconsistent theories. You know, in a Venn diagram, there would be some overlap of theological determinism and compatibilism, some overlap of materialistic determinism and compatibilism. Um, there probably is, although I'm not sure I can think of who might have done this, there probably is a theory that tries to unite materialistic determinism with um, theological determinism. And in fact, I can almost remember um, a scenario where I think a fellow grad student had been studying such a theory and, and told me who it was, what was the name of this philosopher. I can almost remember the name of a philosopher who might have that theory, but I hesitate to, to name that person for you just in case I get it wrong. Let's not, let's not risk that mistake. But there's plenty of overlap between these theories. And then, of course, we have the theory that we have strong free will. The theory that we have strong free will can come in different varieties. One very sensible, or at least it likes to think it's sensible, because it's the common sense view, 
view is the Reedian common sense theory, which is fairly straightforward. Of course, we have free will. It's just common sense. Duh. Do, do you even need to ask? Um, this is why philosophers have a bad name, because they say that I didn't have the ability to do otherwise than to drink this nice, gigantic cup of tea. Stupid philosophers. And of necessary stupid theologians, stupid scientists. Although probably they're all doing something philosophical here, whether they're uh, arguing from a scientific or theological perspective or whatever. This is why philosophy is silly. Normal people know that they have the ability to do otherwise. That's common sense. And um, philosophers should just shut up. This is a position you can actually find in philosophy. It's the common sense tradition associated with Thomas Reed. I hope I'm not oversimplifying it. I think it's a very wonderful tradition in epistemology. So there's the theory that we have strong free will. It comes in the Reedian account. And then there's also our old friend Kant. The Kantian version says we can't actually prove that we have strong free will. We don't know it by common sense. But we should believe that we have free will because it's necessary for moral action. And then there are theological accounts of free will that are uh, well worth mentioning. Augustine, though I, I believe, again, this pertains more to Adam than to us. Augustine, Boethius, Descartes, Locke, Aquinas. There are people who will give an account of human nature that involves a heavy dose of theology and also says that we have free will. The idea is that God gave us free will. Also, along these lines, note that free will is an extremely important part of how religious philosophers respond to the problem of evil. This connects, as everything else connects, to everything else in philosophy. This isn't just metaphysics. We're also on the edge of philosophy of religion. And heaven knows what else. We're also dealing with epistemology and, and ethics and everything else. Should I, should I make those connections? Um, I just made a connection with Reed and Kant. Um, Kant says we have uh, rational grounds for believing that we have free will, even though we don't have good evidence for free will. Again, as I've probably mentioned to you, Kant is what seems initially uh, strange to us. He says we can't give good evidence that God exists or that there is life after death or that there is free will, but I can give darn good evidence that you ought to believe it. And Reed has a connection between epistemology and the theory that we have free will in the strong sense. He thinks we know this by common sense, and it's actually not much of an account of how we know it, which is why Alvin Plantinga comes along later to describe in more detail how we know common sense principles. And connections to ethics, well, for one thing, there's Dennett. Dennett saying, of course, determinism is compatible with moral judgment and with punishment for certain kinds of wrongdoing that deserve punishment, that need punishment. Murderers need to be punished. Why is it fair if there was no chance of acting otherwise? Because a murderer does what he, what he does. Because it's not his consciousness being forced by his brain to murder. He is his whole brain. The whole brain decided to murder. So there's always connections to ethics, philosophy, religion, and epistemology when we're doing metaphysics. You probably already knew this. I probably said it plenty of times before. What are some of the major objections to free will? The standard objection to free will in this particular context in academia these days, the standard objection to free will, as I understand it, relies on the idea that human beings are purely physical. The traditional argument would go something like this. The physical world operates by physical laws which have no exceptions. We are purely physical beings, so we operate by physical laws which have no exception. You can modify the argument for prominent uh, interpretations of contemporary physics, of quantum mechanics, something like this. The physical world operates only by physical laws which have no exceptions plus random quantum events. We are purely physical beings, so we operate only by physical laws which have no exceptions and by random quantum events. So one of these obviously would uh, exclude strong determinism, and the other would only exclude Sorry, one of these would entail strong determinism. The only one would other entail uh, weak determinism. Other kinds of objections to free will are possible. Objections from the sovereignty or authority of God. Uh, you may, if you like, study Al-Ghazali and see if he does that. I haven't studied him enough, at least not on that particular topic. What are the difficulties with determinism? So arguments for determinism may go in this way from materialism and so on. What are some difficulties with determinism? Well, the the rough 
ordinary person reaction goes something like this. I have the ability to pick this cup of tea up now, or not. I have the ability to to pick up this phone charger, or not. I have the ability to, to twiddle my thumbs, or not. I could do this with my fingers, or I could do this with my fingers, and no one's forcing me to decide, and I'm not being forced by anything else to decide, and I'm not even being forced by myself and in Dennett's account. I had a, po a chance of doing other than I do. This is the common sense approach. It seems contrary to common sense to say that we have no ability to do otherwise. This may be a difficulty with, with um, determinism. One possible objection is that it removes the responsibility for action. If there's determinism, then we have no responsibility for our actions. This seems to be Kant's concern. Now, keep in mind, again, Dennett has a, an account which, is attempt, uh, which attempts to justify how we can have moral responsibility even if we are determined. And then maybe the major thing, uh, the major possible difficulty with uh, determinism is that the usual version of it, these days at least, presumes materialism. And if materialism uh, doesn't have any good evidence for it, or if we have reasons to doubt materialism, uh, universals, or uh, puzzles of material constitution, or mind-body problems, or anything else we talked about this semester, or all the other possible uh, challenges to, ma to materialism that we have not had time to talk about this semester, if any of that works well as an objection to materialism, then that may be a major reason to doubt determinism, or at least to doubt some prominent evidence sometimes cited for it. Now what is to be said on behalf of determinism? What is this evidence? As far as I can tell, the main evidence these days is just materialism. If we have good evidence for materialism, we have good evidence for at least weak determinism. If we don't, we don't. I'll uh, pause to jot down in my notes uh, on the Google document linked for Moodle that you can also give evidence from theology and for that matter Spinoza is a determinist. Early modern philosopher Spinoza uh, develops a really interesting metaphysics and we're determined according to his metaphysics. And I, I think if you follow his arguments, well, I can't promise you won't find any problems with them. It's at least going to be a challenge to find any problems with them, unless it's with his definition of substance. Uh, start with his definition of substance, and a whole, whole, whole lot seems to follow. So arguments like that from such a definition of substance might be other interesting reasons to defend determinism. But materialism is the big one, at least in in academia these days. Now my notes give you some pointers on Kant because it's kind of important because I had notes on it already and I thought I should give them to you. I'm not going to go over them in this video. You think it's plenty long already. I tend to agree.